I'm actually be a heretic to say that the body is bad. The body is not bad. It says sinful nature in the body that is bad. The fallen nature, the broken nature, the broken cistern that you just said. Let me just start off with this. Welcome to another video. Welcome to the next episode of the Final Hour Podcast. This is my brother David, anointed man of God. The guy is profound, but he also is sincere in his walk with Christ, pursues the heart of God, and is hungry for the things of the Lord with a sincerity. Man, man of God, how are you today? I'm doing blessed, bro. Thank you for having me on today. Sure. You know, it's a blessing to be here. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a beautiful day, bro. It's yeah, a beautiful man. day. Um, I think uh, these past couple of days we had been speaking about, like, the just the need for, you know, sound doctrine, right? Yeah. It's something you brought up. And I think in, in, this t in these times it's very prevalent that, you know, we're studying to show ourselves approved, right? Um, Amen. The Bible says that there's a way that's, that seems right to a man, but in a way leads towards death, right? So to know who God is, is to know the, the heart of God, right? We can think that we might have some sort of an understanding of who God is, but um, you know, our perspective can be, can be skewed. We can be definitely looking at it from, from a broken lens, if I can put it that way. But when you know the heart of God, what do you think it is? The way to know the heart of God would be to, you know, start with the gospel is definitely right. I think you can't just have a form of religion. You need to, you know, see what God's heart was relaying right in that scripture. I think that's where you start off. Um, so first and foremost, right, it's important that people know that Jesus is God, right? He's not uh, one third of God. He's not, um, he doesn't take different forms, right? He is the word before. So I think the, the gospels, you know, establish that pretty well. Um, like who Jesus is in the terms of his divinity and how he's always existed. So I think that's a good place to, to start off. There's a purity in this word. There's a purity in this message. The design of God was always family, right? It was never, you were supposed to do life alone. No one's ever supposed to do life alone. God even told Adam in the beginning, it is not good for man to be alone. Either with a wife or with a brother or with, in community, man is not supposed to be alone. Culture has already corrupted the mindsets of, of young people especially because they tell them you got you to gotta go to college to support yourself. You got you to gotta find a job to support yourself. And I'm not saying those things are bad, right? But if we go too far, we can kick ourselves in the foot and fall out of the design of God, right? I'm not saying subject to, to toxicity either, right? There has to be wisdom. Everything that I'm saying has to be backed up by the word and the design that the word is, um, that the way that, that God intended for it to be, the design. We are supposed to discern the, the design and the spiritual things are discerned spiritually. You can, I, I can't prove to you a spiritual thing. I can tell you there's angels around us, which there are, the angel of the Lord encamps around those that, that fear God. But I can't prove it to you tangibly. I can't say, angel, manifest uh, your robe so I can show your robe to my brother David. I can't do that. Right? Made unclean. It has, bro. You know, the thing with sin, if it isn't dealt with right initially, then what it does is it continues festering in the hidden parts of a person's heart. So, you know, like in these end days, it says, that people would call what is evil, they would call it good. And what is good, they would call it evil, right? So I think that's just the times and the signs we're living in this, in this day. Um, that's why it's important to know who God is, right? To actually discern what is uh, good and acceptable and to Him. Right, so the mindset that, uh, that every person has before they come to Christ, I'm pretty sure if you're a believer, Right? You, you used to think like the world. So everything in a way was corrupted to you. Everything seemed funny to you in a very corrupted way. You know what I mean? Um, not just humorously, but it, it was just corrupting your own mind. Because that is, that is the nature of the world. Right? But after coming to the Lord Jesus, um, He washes your mind. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He corrects you. He fixes you. And you literally become a new person. 
to where the old you becomes this distant stranger because you're like i can't believe like you know we made those kind of jokes you know that were very uh impure you know it was a form of impurity but it seemed normal to people of the world it's like ah you know like and can you say like just just stupid stuff right that was a norm for us that lived in the world that are part of the culture of the world you know like ah the masses don't chase you know get over it but it's and the reality is that when you come to the Lord Jesus and you get into the profound things of God, like the the deeper you go, the more profound you go in the Word, the more profound you go with the Holy Spirit, the more profound He takes you into the waters, right into the into the the depths. The more the the mentalities of the world will seem distant. They'll seem like man, like that's so far away. Like you can't believe that you were wired that way at some point. And every person that's watching that has a genuine conversion, um, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I mean? Oh, definitely, bro. You know, when I remember when I was still in the world, right, battling with it, uh, there was a bunch of things that I struggled with, you know. I think the world looks forward to, to Fridays, right? People live for the Fridays, for the weekends, yeah. right? Just for that, that short, temporary, you know, fix, right? Oh, I can't wait till it's Friday. I can't wait till I, till I can drink, right? Or I can sleep around for you know with this person right or mess around but um like the word of god says right behold you know like the old person is dead right he makes all things new uh to you know add to that what you're saying the the bible says in romans uh 12 2 right to being be uh, not transformed to the patterns of this world right so this culture you know everything around us is following like an algorithm, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Right? We, we know we react because of what we see in the news, right? Or the music we listen to. You know, so even music, it, it can play on your emotions, right? And so what the devil does is he takes something, you know, good, and he perverts it and he twists it. That's why we have to be renewed by the word of God, right? Amen. Yeah, um, definitely. Because without that, we won't have discernment. We won't have wisdom. And like the psalmist says, right? Uh, you know, I've hidden your word in my heart, so I might not sin against you, right? If we, if we love God, then we will be doers of the word and not just, you know, listeners, right? Uh, the, the Bible says that, you know, the person that does that, he looks in the mirror and that person just quickly forgets who he is. And the hypocrisy is like, for example, we're both ministers, right? I hope that I don't ever give a word to anyone. For example, if I, if I preach something, if it's in the Word of God or if it's prophetic, prophetic is not just foretelling the future. Prophetic can be uh, just being a mouthpiece for God. He will speak against a certain sin or, or, or an encouragement or, or whatever. right? But I'm referring specifically in the context of sin. Because I know the Lord uses me strong to preach against sin. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I hope... To never give a word against the sin that I want to give to myself first. Because if I don't give it to myself first, for one, I'm being a hypocrite like the Pharisees were. They were whitewashed tombs, meaning they were okay to judge everybody else. That's why Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 7, do not judge. But the way that Jesus meant it, do not judge hypocritically. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if I struggled with alcoholism uh, before coming to Christ, if I did, and at the same time I was preaching to, to people, uh, you know, Repent of your alcoholism, you know, get right with the Lord. You know, alcohol does not please the Lord. Am I preaching the correct message? I am. But the character of me preaching that message to an alcoholic, when I myself am an alcoholic, that's what God is against. That's why Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye before Amen. you look at the speck of someone else. You're referring in that context because the Pharisees, that was the Sermon on the Mount. The Pharisees were being hypocritical. They were saying, you have to follow this and that. You have to be circumcised to be saved. You have to do this and that. Right, well, they themselves were a brood of vipers. They cared about the money. They cared about the, about the the visual. They cared about the way that they were perceived. Traditions. It was traditions. They put a facade. They they wanted to be seen by the other people and regarded as men of God for their own ego, for their own uh, status. Right. It was all vanity. It was all mm. vain. But God saw the God Jesus in the form. Jesus is God in the flesh. Could see right through them, and He said, "You're not really like that." You know, 
uh, and Jesus even told the, the people that were listening to the Pharisees, Jesus himself said, they're teaching the, the they're teaching what comes what they say and what they teach is correct. You know, do as they say, not as they do. Meaning the preaching is correct. The material that is coming out of their out of their vocal cords, out of their mouth, is correct information. However, their character is not aligned with my heart. So do as they say, not as they do. So it is possible for me, right? I'm putting myself first. Right, I hope to put myself before every time I, I, I give a strong word against sin. Like, has this applied to me first? Right. Right. Um, otherwise, I'd be a hypocrite. Can people potentially be hypocrites? Yeah. We're still here. We're still in the fallen nature. I am not exempt. We're not exempt. Nobody's exempt from. Oh man. Carbonated, from being a hypocrite. Right. But this is where we have to have the humility to realize, you know what, God. Uh, and even then, that word. Even though you felt it might have been given hypocritically, God's like, I'm waiting for you to take it into account for yourself. You know, God works in, in ways that sometimes we're like, oh, you know, like I, I feel like I shouldn't have given that word against that sin when I myself might be struggling against that. And God's like, okay, you gave this word, but eventually I want, I mean, first, my intent is for you to receive it for yourself first and then take it to, to others. But God in His mercy and in His grace, it'll be like, okay, so when are you gonna, when are you gonna apply it to yourself, right? But it is possible, like it, oh, the camera turned off. And I told David, I'm like, David, we're gonna talk about this. Not what we're talking about right now, but about something else. We're gonna we're gonna talk about you know the the, the warning against false teachers, because it's actually a legit thing. But I just feel the Holy Spirit led us somewhere else. But anyway, like the camera turned off and not to turn it back on. If you go to first Samuel chapter 19, back to the point that we're talking about right now. Look at this. This is Saul pursuing David, persecuting him. Like he wants to delete him, right? And it says here, verse 20, when he sent troops to capture him, meaning Saul was sending people to chase after David, he sent troops to capture him. But when they arrived and saw Samuel leading a group of prophets who were prophesying, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they also began to prophesy. So how is someone that's on their way to like delete somebody, they start prophesying, bro. They were going to do evil. And they started prophesying. You know? And then, verse 22, Finally, Saul himself went to Ramah and arrived at the great well in, Se in Seku. Uh, where are Samuel and David? He demanded. They're at, well, he was looking for them, right? But also, if you go to verse 24, no, verse 23. But on the way to Nioth, in Ramah, the Spirit of God came even upon Saul, the one that was persecuting David. And he too began to prophesy all the way to Neoth. And then in the end it says, what is even Saul the prophet? So that is 1 Samuel chapter 19, uh, verses 23 all the way to 24. So that just proves Matthew chapter, is it? Yeah, Matthew 7, where it says, Lord, Lord, they will not prophesy in your name. They will not cast out demons in your name. They were doing all these supernatural things. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon people so that they can do miraculous things. And even then, Saul was on his way to delete David. And even then he was prophesying even though he had a heart full of evil and hate. He was already an apostate. That just goes on to support the Matthew 7 that Jesus said, doesn't matter you're prophesying my name, I never knew you. He knew Saul, but Saul fell away. That is an example of apostasy, right? But that just, that just goes on to show that you know we can, we a Christian can do all these wonderful things, miracles, signs, wonders, but if they don't have this conscious decision to follow Jesus or to conform to the image of Jesus, they're not in right standing with God. Because there's there's Jesus said, "Why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say?" So that that's actually very scary, bro. Because you can you you sometimes people are not able to tell. Because they're like, this is a man of God, this is a woman of God, you know, she or, or, or he is doing all these wonderful things, campaigns for the Lord, events for the Lord, they're on flyers, you see them on, on flyers, you know, they're very well regarded. And I'm not saying that, that they are, right, but just an example, just to give an example, right, um, they can be highly regarded, but God knows their, their, their real life, mm -hmm. their character, the way that they truly are. The way that, not the way that they are as in like they don't wrestle with it, but the way that they're deciding to be if they're not making 
an effort, right? They're not uh, working out their salvation with fear and trembling. They're just doing it because they got clout. You know, that's a very dangerous thing, bro. And uh, I like how you mentioned the other day, like we were talking, right? How Kanye was in a good place at one, at one point. You know, he was sincere. And if you listen to the music, his, he was going the right direction. No, he didn't have it all down at all. He didn't have it all down, right? But um, I think it was just a, an issue of him not being discipled correctly. And that's what, like you said, you know, the devil, the devil sifted him. I think that's the importance of, uh, you know, it's not essential, right, initially, but eventually uh, for your growth, right, I think it's important that you find a, a spirit-filled church, right, uh, a place where they're preaching against sin and encouraging holiness, right, uh, maintaining the Word of God as the highest authority. Um, you see one of the, the churches that Jesus is addressing in Revelation, right, mm. Jesus is commending them for their good works, for their love, and for their service, right? But he, he has this one thing against them. Mm. He says that they've forsaken their first love, right? So it all begins with, the, with how we're serving God through our heart, right? Through, our, through genuine worship, right? Uh, because to worship God is to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is a lifestyle of, uh, of walking in the spirit, right? So <laughs> you're going to have to cut that off. Um, I got you. So it's just very important, right? God looks at the, the heart, right? But man looks at the outward appearance. And like we were saying, uh, the gifts of God, they're irreproachable. That means so someone could be doing right, but still be in the wrong, right? Be living in unrepented sin. And that's where, you know, I, I eventually, you know, time reveals everything, right? Like whatever's in in the darkness is brought to light. Yeah. Uh, judgment always begins with the with the house of the Lord first. Yeah, and that that brings into question, like people are like, okay, talk about like people that are not believers, not Christians, not followers of Jesus. They say, well, I was a good person. Like, so you're saying that if I don't like do anything bad throughout my lifetime, God is still gonna send me to hell. Well, you gotta take into consideration that. First of all, God is the creator and the author of all things. So why are we making God in our own image when we're made in God's image? So we're, we as creation are telling the creator, this is how it ought to be. This is how it ought to be. Like, first of all, we have to get off our, heart, our high horse. And the issue of why a lot of people struggle with belief is because of, of, of pride. And sometimes people are, are blinded by their own pride. And they say, well, my say matters more than God's say. Uh, but a lot of that is that God even provided a, a solution so that you wouldn't, you know, go to hell after you die. Because that's the reality of it, guys. I can try to say, oh, you know what? Stay away from using those words, David. Stay away from using those words, you know, in the podcast. But we don't want to offend anybody. No, we are here to tell you the truth. And in all honesty, I'm making this podcast because there's a lot of corruption. Like you mentioned, you have to, have, you have to find a spiritual church. And sometimes those churches are rare. You have to look for them with the looking glass. Sometimes I can buscarlos con lupa, you know what I mean. So it's not easy finding the spirit-filled churches, and sometimes there are regions and cities that don't have at least one spirit-filled church, and that is that's the sad thing about it, guys. And um, it's it's important to to look for a spirit-filled church because you have to, what is originally good is originally good. Like in other words, if I get a dollar bill, right, and I get familiar with that dollar bill. To the point where I'm able to determine a real dollar bill from a fake dollar bill, right? And if you go someplace where you're uh, a cashier, right, and your register's full of uh, counterfeit bills, you know, there are just because you're like, oh, there has to be a real dollar bill somewhere, so I guess I'll just conform with um, the counterfeit bills. No, no, I mean, stick to that real dollar bill that standard i'm talking about the standard right i'm not saying there's a perfect church out there but there is a remnant out there and they're not necessarily inside affiliated ministries sometimes a remnant is someone in, in your in your class at school sometimes the remnant is someone that's genuine that has a sincere heart for the lord because it, 
just because they go to church doesn't mean they're on fire for God. They can say they're on fire for God. They can lift their hands and cry during worship. But you discern. You can discern when they're sincere about the heart of God. They're, they're for real about advancing the kingdom of God. Not necessarily like, you know, getting the camera like we are and, and getting to work. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying like the heart is sincere. Right? They, they see God in spirit and in truth. And um, sometimes the real remnant, you'll find those people. And it's not a group. Sometimes it's just one person. In the book of Genesis, Noah and his family were the only family in the entire planet that were counted righteous in God's eyes. And Lot was the only righteous one in Sodom and Gomorrah before God decided to rain down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Call a spade a spade for what it is. Lot was the only one that cringed at unrighteousness. He was scared. The word of God says that he was genuinely scared because of all the sin that he saw. He was traumatized. The only one in the whole in the entire city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So there is a remnant out there, right? It might be one person or it might be a group of people. But don't lower your standards because you can't find anybody else. Right? I know my brother David is remnant. I've seen the fruit. And it's not just the way that he speaks, but in the way that he acts also. I'm speaking on behalf of, of, of him because I've seen the fruit. I've seen his character. And it aligns with the word of God. There's a sincerity, there's a humility behind it. Right, and you know, um, and I'm not trying to bash on anybody, but you might find, uh, for example, if I was a worship leader, and I was, I, I did not reflect the character of Christ, but my words said that I was, right? What are you going to believe, the way that I act or, or the way that I talk? Right. So if I were to conform and fellowship with with a lukewarm hypocrite, which is what it is, I'm not trying to insult. I'm just trying to call a spade a spade, call it for what it is. Right. I'm lowering my standards and I'm making room for corruption. I'm making because. Associated with corruptions will corrupt your good morals, like mm -hmm. the Word of God says. 100%. Yeah, so if I, if I choose to associate with, with someone that's willingly corrupt and that doesn't care about conforming to the heart of God, that doesn't acknowledge their struggles, or maybe they do, but they just are deciding not to do anything with it and just indulge because they're like, oh, what are you going to do about it? I'm only a human being. Um, you know, God says not to judge, right? If we go by that, then we're allowing to ourselves to get corrupted and we're lowering our standards from the standard that God has. The standard is by default Christ. He is the standard. God is saying, I'm giving you grace because if I see you striving to be like Christ, remember, the Word of God says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right? So if God sees us working hard, um, our salvation with, with fear and trembling, with a reverence, with a sincerity, that's when God gives you the grace. And it's like, even though you fall, I'm going to wash away your sin, you know, and I'll, I'll shower you with the grace. Right? We cannot outwork God's grace. Right? But if God sees that we're like, oh, you know what? Let me indulge in it. Lord, what are you going to do? And we basically just like, um, we disrespect God and we disregard His, His, uh, His majesty and, and we don't fear God. Then does, does grace really apply to us? Because it says in the book of Hebrews, once somebody receives the knowledge of sin and they continue onward, they have uh, crucified the Son of God once again and they trampled over His blood. Meaning, if I receive a knowledge of sin, and if David brings it to my attention, right, and I know in my heart, I'm not saying that I'm struggling to realize it. No, like I know that I know that I'm in sin and I, st I still continue to indulge in alcoholism, for example. There, when I truly know I'm disrespecting the blood of Jesus and I'm saying, uh, you know, it's whatever. We're treating it like Kool-Aid when the blood of Jesus is the most powerful thing in existence, the most powerful weapon, Right. So that's a very dangerous path to go down to and basically it's a reprobate mind and it's an apostate heart right so let's not lower our standards like my brother said when you uh when you know what a real dollar bill is compared to a to to a counterfeit bill maintain that standard i'm not saying yes the standard of heaven basically i'm not saying to not forgive others faults because it does say in the book of first thessalonians make allowance for each other's faults right but allow yourself to fellowship with people that are genuine about repenting and they know they're broken but they're continuously in in the road to repentance they have a sincere heart right there um it's not self-righteousness or it's not ignorance or it's not hypocrisy like you know that they have a sincere and contrite heart look for that person that is sincere about the lord now be careful right because in that person's assembly block it says in galatians you that are spiritual, restore the brother. But be mindful of yourself. 
if you know, even if you know someone's sincere, if I know my brother David's sincere, and for example, if, he's, if he struggles with alcohol, that's just an example, right? And he doesn't, right? But if I get, my, if I get close to David, and he, he's a sincere believer, but I know that I can stumble, then I'm going to be wise and be like, you know what, like, I'm going to draw a line, right? And let another brother that is stronger against that, you know, to go ahead and minister to my brother David, or, or they can fellowship, right? Because David is not a stumbling block to the brother that's, that alcohol is not um, a vice to. But if it's a vice to me, I'm going to be like, hey, bro, like, yeah, let's hang out. But, I mean, I don't want to go to, to somewhere where they serve alcohol because then I might fall. And that's just an example. Again, it's all walking in the Spirit. It's all having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're not really going to understand. You need the Holy Spirit to be your translator. I think going on top of that, right, like, uh, there's a story in the Bible, right, where there's a farmer planting good seeds, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, it says the enemy overnight plants uh, tares, right? Yeah. And the, the thing with the wheat and the tares is growing up, they look very similar. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. This is why we need discernment. And it says, you know, shall we take out uproot, you know, the, the tares? But it says no, because if we do, we might accidentally up, uproot the, the children of God, right? Amen. Those planted by God. Uh, so... But it says at the very end, right, that God goes and collects the wheat and takes it at his barn, right? He takes it at eternal life. Uh, but the, with the shaft, right, the, the tares, it says he goes and gets them because they're useless. They have a form of godliness. We, these people, they're already condemned. It says that the, they're tied in chains, right, and they're tossed into eternal fire. Um, and another reason it's really important for church is because... It creates accountability. Amen. You know, if you're in isolation, that's like desolation. I like saying that, right? You're going to be a casualty because best believe, right, when you're by yourself, if you're not strong enough, right, or you don't have nobody to stand there with you, right? The, the Bible Amen. says, woe to the man, you know, that falls but has no one to pick him up. Mm. But when you're connected with other brothers and sisters, right, I can tell you, hey, bro, you know, I'm struggling with alcohol. Or, hey, bro, you know, I'm struggling with, you know, forgiving this person. Right? If I isolate myself, then I'm avoiding accountability. Amen. I'm avoiding accountability. And, you know, I'm going to think that I'm still right in my own eyes, right? But it takes a brother seeing, right? Someone dealt with the log in their own eye for you to you know, out of a place of, of healing and understanding to say, hey, bro, you're, you're kind of wrong here, right? And Jesus says we're two or more, you know, are gathered in his name. You know, he'd be there. This is what Jesus always wanted was fellowship, right? You look at the disciples in Acts. They each, you know, sold their possessions and they came together for the, for the greater good, right? They, they weren't selfish, but they wanted to, they all had the, the same mission and the same goal in mind. And that's what's so powerful with unity. Like with uh, the, the people in the Tower of Babel, right? Yeah. They were all in one mind, one unity. And God says, you know, I have to come down and, and tear their whole mission apart, right? Because if I don't, they're going to reach their goal, right? So, you know, the devil can be that coordinated and work together then why can't we right why can't we as christians sometimes why why do you think that is like why we struggle like coming together and unifying and you know being able to see eye to eye sometimes <clears throat> because down the line there was some sort of mentality that was planted into somebody and that became a popular mentality so that popular mentality is something that is watered down like a trickle doctrine. That's why it says in, in, um, in the book of 1 Timothy, you know, in the last days, people will, will be deceived and, and follow doctrines of demons, right? Um, and a form of that is because man has given the Bible their own interpretation. You know, it says in, in, in the book of Peter, um, Scripture is not up for interpretation. You know, what the Word of God means is what the Word of God, what the Word of God says is what the Word of God means, right? But you have to have, again, the discernment of the Holy Spirit the anointing of the Holy Spirit, like it says in, in the book of um, First John, no, mm, yeah, I think, yeah, First John chapter three. Let me pull it up for you. Okay, 
So 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you read it, it says here, But you are not like that, for the Holy One has given you His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. So, basically what John is saying, the Holy Spirit is the imprint of God in us. When God deposits the Holy Spirit, He gives you the discernment. Okay, now I'm giving you goggles so you can see the spiritual things, so you can discern the spiritual things. He's giving you the vision. Right, that's just one of the things the Holy Spirit gives you is, is spiritual vision. Right, those who have eyes to see, let them see. No, sorry, those who have ears to hear, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. To what the Spirit is saying, right? And it's also being able to discern because somebody that doesn't have the Holy Spirit is is still carnal. They're not able to discern the spiritual things of God. Right, the spiritual things of God, I can't prove it to you. Like I just said earlier, you know, I can't prove to you that there are angels around us tangibly. I can tell you by the Spirit. I can discern it by the Spirit, right? Um, but I can't show you tangibly right um so it's it's all spiritual in a way that when you receive the deposit of the holy spirit you're gonna want to love the other brother that's one of the desires the holy spirit gives you right if i for example back if you read the book of acts it says that um there was a sincerity when they would gather together in the church they would fellowship and break bread and how was that uh not not the conversion itself but for example if I love Jesus, and I and I find out that you love Jesus. I already, we're like, hey, we're part of the same team, bro. We're, I I love you because you love my Lord, and you love your Lord too, and we have the same Lord, you know. So by default, I'm gonna be like, hey, you know what? What's up? What's going on? You know, like by default, I already feel this connection to you, right? And it's like a, a sincere connection. It's not a connection that's ambitious in the flesh. It's just there's a sincerity behind it, right? So a lot of people have wandered off, right? And I'm 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 addressing the state of some churches in america it's not just you know uh, in some places this is everywhere in america even in uh, other places of the world right there's like a competitiveness um where it's full of ego right um to where it's like oh and this is kind of it's kind of stupid bro like i'm gonna get down to it i'll gonna be honest bro it's kind of pathetic you know like how how are we gonna claim to love jesus and think that my ministry is better than yours isn't that like really sad actually like, well we we said that verse earlier right james three sixteen. it yeah. says where there is like where there's envy and selfish ambition there will be um every false teaching right and what you say where well, there is envy and selfish ambition yes, selfish ambition yeah there is disorder of every kind there is disorder and every vile practice or yeah. every evil practice right yeah so it all it all goes back to the leadership right the people in place if someone knows the heart of god then they'll be able to actually love right with the heart of god but if someone is still dealing with some things right and they try to exalt themselves then they god will humble them right so it's all it always starts at the cross right it always right. starts at you know, denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following Him, right? And that's how we, we reach, like, purity, consecration, holiness through Jesus. Because even though, like, I want to do things, right, it's not, it's no longer I who lives, right? But it's Christ who lives in me. The life, I allow, the life I now live, I live by faith, by putting my trust in the Son of God, right? Behold, all things have passed, and the new has come. Amen. And like you read 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm saying a lot of Timothy because a lot of gold nuggets are here in this book. First and Second Timothy, right? And we spoke about Titus earlier, right? You read 1 Timothy chapter 3. It has the standard for leadership, right? This is the way that, that um, a design that God has, right? So that there would be minimal corruption, uh, minimal fallacies, right? You want to minimize that, right? So if it says here, Sorry. It says here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, an elder, meaning a leader in the church, right? They just use a different terminology. Uh, must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fail, to fall. Sorry. So if I was a new believer and I would already be given a congregation or if I would already be given a, a position of power in the church, right? If I'm still not, if I haven't found, if the Holy Spirit, if I have not uh, put my footing correctly on the rock, Right? I climb the rock, which is Christ, and I'm on the rock. But if I don't have secure footing, 
The devil's going to come and try to like send waves so that I can fall from the rock, right? Uh, now, I'm not saying the devil can sift you away, but uh, you can fall away. The devil cannot like pluck you out, right? Or he can pluck out the message from you. It's crazy how that works. Because Jesus said that no one can sift him out of his hand. But at the same time, the devil can steal the seed away, right? Uh, it's not contradictory. There's just different dimensions of understanding and how... I'm telling you, if you read it by the scriptures, you might think there's contradictions. But you have to have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to give you that understanding of like, no, this is what it means. Why? And how do you know that? Because the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness, right, to this and be like, oh, it was like this. And you're like, oh, okay. And I'm telling you, these things are not discerned physically, but they're discerned spiritually, right? So, for example, if you put somebody that's new, a new believer, right, and they can become proud. And not only that, the dangerous thing, bro, is that that leader is now the standard of, of Christianity in the eyes of the congregants. What do the congregants do not know any better? They're going to look at that and be like, oh, is that what the standard of, of being a, a Christ-like person looks like? Really? Right? Some people can discern correctly the ones that have had, uh, that have a firm footing in the Lord, uh, with the Lord, on the rock. But there are some that still don't know they don't read their word they don't they don't have fellowship with the holy spirit they don't pray they just go and they're hoping to get fed whatever is there and i feel compassion for that for them because they might have sincere hearts but because they don't know any better they're easily deceived right so it's very dangerous to put someone in power that is that is not striving to be the image of christ at all they're just there uh for, for ego reasons because they can become the standard in the eyes of somebody that doesn't know any better and it might cause the other sheep to fall away. And they get scattered. Or, let me give you one worse one. They get fed false doctrine. They get fed, uh, a doctrine is a form of belief. They get fed false doctrine. They get fed something else that is contradictory or erroneous to the word of God. To where when they finally learn the truth, they're going to be like, this is not what they taught us back then. And they're going to dislike the truth. Or two, they're going to have a hard time marinating the truth. Because they're like, I read it here in the Bible. But I trusted this person to give me the, the, the truth of the Lord. But I trusted this person to the point where I thought they were giving me the word of God. But now that I read the word of God for myself, it goes completely against to what they're saying. And that's when people that think they know wrestle with the truth. And that's a very dangerous spot to be in. That's why you have to really discern the things of God. You have to get in the word for yourself, right? Um, so if you go to the book of 1 Timothy, again, it's, I'm telling you, there's a lot of gold nuggets here. Spiritual gold nuggets. Chapter 1, right off from verse 3, it says, Warning against false teachers. I'm reading from the NLT. It'll have that subheading, Warning against false teachers. The same book, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Warning against false teachers. So chapter 1 and 4 correlate in Warning against false teachers. If you go to chapter 6, in the same book, False Teachers and True Riches, talks about those that, that evaluate the riches of this world more than the spiritual rich, riches. It says here in, in, the, in the Word of God, you know, um, Yet true godliness with contentment, with contentment in itself is great wealth, right? True godliness is great, is great wealth. So you can ask the Lord, Lord, I want to be wealthy. And God's like, I'm giving you a godly, uh, I've helped you reach godliness with the Holy Spirit because he's the helper. And that, that is like, I'm, I'm wealthy. Back then, before the old covenant, remember, the Holy Spirit came upon people, but He didn't dwell inside the believer, like in the New Covenant, right? The, the veil was torn. So David had riches, and Solomon had riches as a physical representation, so we can understand that it's great wealth having the favor of God. But in the New Testament, wealth is defined as godliness. It's not having a car. It's not having a, a, a nice phone. It's not having a Lamborghini. We're seeing, we're seeing that be preached as, as prosperity in, in, in the church of God and people are being deceived. I'm not saying, I feel compassion for the people that are eating that up because they might not know any better. But the people that are, that are spewing that garbage, they know better. Because they've been in the Evangelio for years. They've been in the, in, in the ways of the Lord for years, but they haven't. It just shows by what the message that they preach. It's not by the... By, um, they can preach the true thing, but again, do as they say, not as they do. But you have, at the same time, you have to examine, does the Word of God align with what they're preaching? Use the Word. You can judge. John 7, 24 says, do not judge hypocritically. Matthew 7, do not judge hypocritically. But you have to use, again, judge 
righteously. What does it mean to judge righteously? You use a standard of judgment. You, you measure everything by the word of God. This is the straight line. This is God's message to humans in the form of a straight line. Right? And we have to judge it by this standard. We have to weigh it by the standard. We cannot pronounce judgment as a, like a condemnation or salvation aspect because I, I can't do that. David can't do that. Nobody can do that. Right? I can't say, oh, David, you're saved or you're not saved. That's not up to me, but God alone. It says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. But we can judge righteously, but in the, in the context that it's being used is that use a standard of measurement to weigh spiritual things. Meaning, if I'm preaching prosperity as you having a big house, a dream house, or a dream car, by what we just read, 1 Timothy chapter 6, for example, this is an example of righteous judgment, bro. If I'm preaching to you, I want to God, um, uh, pro pray to God for Lamborghini. God will bless you with prosperity. God wants to prosper you. But it says here in First Timothy chapter six, I'm weighing it now. My, I'm weighing my own word that I just gave you, right? It's not a real word from God, but I mean that's just an example. The Lamborghini that I'm prophesying to you. I'm weighing it. I'm about to weigh it with the scriptures. For example, First Timothy chapter six, verse six. Yet true godliness with contentment in itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take everything with us when we leave. So we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. right? But people who long to be rich, this is verse 9, fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Meaning, if you desire that Lamborghini more than the wealth that comes with godliness, you are about to be disappointed. Why? Because I'm putting my trust into something that's fallible, into something that's material. There is no such thing as a perfect material thing. Eventually, when, when uh, pretty sure when this phone came out, it was considered perfect. But eventually, over time, it was never perfect. From the very beginning, it had a flaw. Maybe you were ignorant about that flaw, but it had a flaw. Right. Eventually, everything's going to fade away and fall apart. That car you have from, from 10 years ago, if you drive a, a 2010 car, right, has it not been corroded in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. Maybe when you first got it, you, you thought, it was appeasing to me, it's appealing to me, right? But over time, it's going to grow mold. Not mold, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get rusty. Um, it's going to have its defects over time. It's not going to last forever. Meaning, if I put my faith into something that's the material, it's going to fade away. And that's a foolish thing to do because I'm putting my, my trust into something that's on sand, not on the rock. Right? So it is a good thing to judge everything by the word of God. We cannot pronounce judgment as in saying, um, you're saved or I'm saved. Right? We can't do that. We can look at the fruit and say, well, it looks like they're acting like a heathen. Go ahead. I know you want to say something. <laughs> it's a recipe, right? God's yeah. given us uh, Matthew 6.33, right? Uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added on to you, right? So God wants to bless us. Okay. And I say this, like, God likes to receive us as we are, regardless, right? Because the Bible says all have fallen short and of the glory of God, right? So no one can say they have no sin. If anyone tells you they're holy or they're sinless, the truth of God isn't in them. Yeah. Uh, God is more concerned with our transformation, right? And becoming more like Christ. Uh, and... To add to this, like First Peter, uh, chapter one, verses one through seven, it says, "In this rejoice, uh, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ Jesus." Amen. Because. If we put our treasure here, right, then we'll constantly feel like we're lacking. We'll never have enough. We'll never have enough money. We'll never have enough relationships, right, that can fill us. The only one who can fill those things is Jesus, right? Anytime yeah. we put our trust outside of Jesus, we're drinking from a broken cistern. It's like a jar, right, that can't hold water. Um, and only Jesus, right, can, can quench that thirst and actually, you know, fill us. 
and we won't hunger again, right? He gives, he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. It's like, for example, also, right? Because what they're teaching, right? I'm weighing it by the Word of God. I'm not giving you my opinion. We're not giving you our opinion. We're giving you the Word of God, what the Word truly says. See, this is why it's an issue to stay away from false teaching. No, this is why it's an issue of eating up false teaching because you heard something that's contrary. I know you're probably getting mad behind the camera and you're like, oh, you can't be judgmental, you can't do this and that. But you're hating the truth. Why? Because you were fed a lie. You've already marinated the lie. So when you consume a lie, when you consume a wrong doctrine, it's much more difficult to you to accept the truth. And I'm literally giving you verses. And I'm not taking them out of context. Read the entire chapter. Read the Word of God for yourself. You will find nothing that points to you elevating material things over, um, over eternal things. Bro, that, that Second Timothy 4.3, yeah. it says, uh, For the time will come, right, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will have itching ears, right? Yeah. They'll, they'll be blown by every teaching of the wind. They have no discernment. It says Amen. they will they shall heap up to themselves teachers in accordance with their own lust. Mm. Right? So if someone is greedy, then naturally they're going to gravitate towards someone who preaches a prosperity gospel. Yeah. If someone is selfish, right, or egotistic, then they're going to be drawn yeah. to something like that. It's like, I'm greedy. You're greedy. Hey, what's up, bro? <laughs> you know, like it's that, it's that kind of thing. And that's the way it works, right? So, look, for example, this is how faulty it is, bro. Like, if you ever pick up a hobby, if you get into something, for example, um, a car hobby or a sport hobby, right? You're always going to want to buy something, which is not bad, right? I'm not saying the, the physical things. Let me, let me just start off with the physical is not bad. God made everything holy. God made everything pure, right? The original design, Adam, the Garden of Eden was, was, was perfection, right? But because of our fallen nature, we can sometimes elevate those things to have more importance over the heavenly things. Like, bro, the body is, is not bad. I'd actually be a heretic to say that the body is bad. The body is not bad. It's the sinful nature in the body that is bad. The fallen nature, the broken nature, the broken cistern that you just said. When you drink out of the broken cistern, you're drinking dirty water. Right? And they, just to give you an example, right? I pick up a hobby. Right? Let's say it's, it's a, I become a car enthusiast. And you car enthusiasts out there, you know what I'm talking about. You get a car. Was the car enough for you? No. Now you want to modify it. <laughs> now you want to modify it. You want to do things that will uh, bring you more joy or, or more happiness. Right? So no longer are you satisfied with having that car. Now you want to modify the car. Don't think about it too much. Now you modified the car. Now you're like, I was still looking online because I want to I add more to it. Now I want to wrap it. Now I want to do other stuff to the car. A straight pipe it. A straight pipe it. <laughs> right? Add an exhaust, you know, um, add a different grill, tail lights, uh, or tune it, whatever, right? And once you do that, it's still not enough. You want more, 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 more. And that's, what's the, that's the fault with pursuing the material things. You will never have enough. You will never have enough. It's like when you work, they always tell you, or like this worldly model, it's, it's secular, it's, but it's a model that everybody uses, stay hungry. That's actually satanic in form of uh, a doctrine. Why? That's the doctrine of demons. Why? Because that hunger is never satisfied. You're never going to get there, you're bro. You're never going like, to get you're, there. You're going to set a goal, right? You're going to get to that very yeah. top of that mountaintop. You're like, is this it? Yeah. Like, have I gotten here? You're like, well, let me look for the next high, right? And let me look for the next high. Yep. And you'll live your life like that. It's like a dog chasing its own tail. And that is the lust of the flesh, too. Don't go too far. Anything. For example, put, fill in the blank. I desire more of blank. Money. Will it ever be enough, bro? Attention. No. Attention. Was... Likes. Status. Think about something that you asked God for five years ago. Material thing. Like a car. Is that car ever enough for you? Maybe if that's not your hobby, yeah, but don't go too far. Something else that you know you're going to want want more of. Money. For example, you ask God for a job then you're like oh now because I have a job I have the ability to buy all these things 
So I want a job that pays more so I can buy these things quicker, so I can get out of debt quicker, right? So it's like a never ending thing. You're chasing your own tail, you will never catch. It's like that commercial, that guy, was it a, a Geico commercial where like- With the, the, the dollar, dollar bill on the like, hook? You almost had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way it is. And that's, that's the devil that is playing with you. Ah, you almost had it. Oh, maybe you gotta summon your soul and I'll let you have that dollar. It's a lie, bro. That's a satanic lie. The physical is not bad. But we must not let it take priority over the heavenly things because it's like we're already on the way out. The bus is on the way. Pack your bags, pick up your family, and get ready to go. Tell your family to get ready. Repent. Get right with the Lord Jesus. Be born again of water and of the Spirit so that you can be ready for the bus. That is how you're ready for the bus. It's very simple. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the remission of your sins. Be baptized. And surrender to God. You can fall away. There's no point in me saying, I believe in Jesus. And my character, my fruit, is there's, there's no fruit of me following Jesus. That is all vain. My words do not have any weight if I don't live it out. In the same manner, we have to live a fear of God. Of God. You can say, oh no, you're just fear-mongering. Is it fear-mongering when it's written in the truth? The truth is right here. Read it for yourself. You don't have to believe it because me and my brother David are talking about it. But read it for yourself. Then you'll find out, oh, you know what? That's the Word of God actually says it. I used to be just like that, man. I used to think, oh... Look at this religious nut, you know, like always talking about like, you know, let go of the things, you know, let him, let, let, let me have fun, right? Ah, he's being too religious, es bien religioso, you know, it's very religious, it's very legalistic. No, when you read the word of God, then you'll be like, oh, snap, it'll slap you. You know, the farther you stay away, the farther you, you stray away from the word of God and buy into teachings of man, the harder the slap of the Bible is going to be. It's a much harsher slap. And, and only because, you know, God is our father, right? Yeah. Like he loves us. He says, you know, he knew us in the womb, right? And he, he divinely set us apart, right? For such a time as this, right? Yeah. In this culture. Um, so you always got to think about it in the perspective of a God that has our best interest in heart, right? Mm -hmm. He says he has thoughts of peace towards us, not evil. You okay. know, plans for a hope and a future. So he's not this wrathful God that it wants to judge you, right? Matter of fact, right? He's welcoming you. He's calling you back, you Amen. know, onto himself, right? And he's just trying to give you a life and a life more abundantly in, in Jesus Christ, you know. Bro, I love how we balance it out. I'm over here preaching like, get right with God. And then you're, and then you're like, yes, that is true. But also, God is a loving Father. I love how you balance it, bro. I, I love like, how we balance it out. I like it saying out. it, right? Yeah. That Jesus came full of truth. Yeah. But he also came full of grace, right? Yeah. Like the woman, right? He called out the hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Let he who has no sin cast the first stone. Right, and then one by one, one by one, one by one, they all left until there was nobody there. And then Jesus says, right, get up, woman, or get up, daughter. Matter of fact, right, he gives her identity. Right. He says, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no, no more. more. Yeah. Now it's up to that daughter to go and sin no more because if she falls away, Jude, verse 5, so I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt. He called that woman daughter, right? He forgave her sins. But later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. So, yes, he's calling you. He's like, do not one of those condemn you? The ones that, that were casting stones, that wanted to cast stones? No, neither do I. The only one that can, Jesus being holy, God himself in the flesh, the only one that could, and he said, I don't condemn you. Daughter, now go and sin no more. Now, hypothetically, if that daughter would have gone back to sin, Jude verse 5 would apply to her. But later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. Meaning, if, if she did not um, take into account her own soul and did not follow Jesus, she said it for destruction. Hypothetically, if she did not listen to what Jesus said. And only because he loves us, right? Yeah. Like, when we accept Jesus, right? He ushers us into the Father, right? So we have this covenant relationship mm -hmm. with Him. We become sons and daughters, born of the Spirit, right? Amen. So, you know, what good Father, Holy right, <laughs> wouldn't chastise or correct, si, right, their son or daughter, yeah. they did something wrong. You know, and it's only because He loves us. Amen. So sometimes, right, when that rod of correction does come, it's because He's trying to guide us and nudge us back into the narrow path. 
Because he loves you. Yeah. Now no one can sift you out. The devil cannot come and sift you out of the hand of God. But our own decisions, if we consciously decide to reject Jesus, because he's a gentleman and he's perfect, he'll be like, you really want to go the other route so bad? I don't want to let you go, but I'll give you over to what you want. That's a very scary place to go. But the Word of God does say, I don't know exactly where, right? Give me grace on this, because I don't know exactly where it says it. But it says that God puts stumbling blocks so that we don't leave them. So if somebody's running away from Jesus, Jesus is like, stumbling block, you trip. And Jesus is like, come back. And you still keep running away. Again, Jesus raises another stumbling block. You trip again. And you look back. And you keep running away. Eventually, you'll run away from Jesus. That can happen when we consciously decide to um, uh, ex extinguish the fire of the Holy Spirit. Not just when it comes upon you to where you feel them tangibly, but the, co the correction of the Holy Spirit. If we refuse to submit to the correction of the Holy Spirit, if we refuse to give up our own way, deny ourselves, pick up a cross and follow Him, eventually, once God calls you over, over, and over, and over, I'm not going to put a number or a recipe to it because I don't know, God might even call you a hundred times. I feel like your heart just gets harder, right? Exactly. So you still hear the, the call, yeah. but it's just a lot harder to hear, right? Because yeah. your ears are muffled. They got stuff in them, yeah. right? Or your eyes, you know, now they're blurry, so you can't see Jesus as clearly. Yeah. And that's a tragic place to be, bro. That's why we have to be careful. We have to read the Word for ourselves because sometimes when we perceive someone else's uh, ideology or we receive their, their point of view about, about something. And I'm not trying to be a hater, man, but I'm trying to... The reason, again, for this video is because there's a lot of falsehood around and they don't... Uh, Bro, what... Have they ever... You know, I feel led to talk about this, Go right? Go for it. Go ahead. You know, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Right? So if you fell back into lust, if you fell back into drinking, right? Or you're cussing again, or whatever your vice is, right? It says there is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? A righteous man may fall seven times. This is a man that's falling seven times. It doesn't specify what he's saying, right? But he rises again. Because right. the Spirit mm -hmm. will say, hey, come on, get up. Come on, keep following me. Yeah. Keep following me. It's okay. My blood covers it. My blood, right. yeah. His blood is still atoning and speaking on our behalf bro mm -hmm. yeah I'm not referring to that I'm referring to if the person makes a, makes a conscious decision to say uh, oh what does the word of God say right if you continue in that way right then you it's like you reject Jesus that's you reject Jesus because there's no more you know grace grace isn't a license to sin yeah. grace doesn't give me you know, permission to go pick up the bottle again. To go and like, you know, sleep around. Because it's always, bro, the goodness, knowing how good, you, you learn how good God is. And His kindness, right? He is kind towards us. It's that very understanding that leads us to repentance. Right, the whole point of grace was for us to repent. I agree. Um... And right up, par, right up par with that, it says here in Jude, I'm using scripture again because you're supposed to use the word of God with everything you hear. What I'm saying, run it by the word. What anybody ever like tells you, run it by the word first. Because again, we can consume an ideology and we can fall in love with an ideology to where it builds a stronghold in our minds. And once we, we read it with the word, once we run it through the word, we have a hard time accepting that ideology. Right. Um, I like how you say that, right? It's like almost like seeing things through shades, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, right, when you test it through the Word of God, it's like finally taking those shades off and seeing things for what they really are. Yeah. That's, that's the lens that the Holy Spirit gives you. Um, that's one of the first things you get, bro. Even unknowingly, I remember when, when I received the Holy Spirit, like, like genuinely, right? When I submitted to the Holy Spirit, and I, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to follow you, Lord. Um, one of the first things that the Lord gave me was discernment and I didn't know what it was like the, um, even the circles that I was with I'm just like I don't want to be here anymore I didn't know what it was 
I just gave my life to the Lord and there was something inside of me just saying, like, like not telling me audibly, but it was like, like a knowing, like, yeah, the time has passed for this. You know, it's no longer beneficial. Um, it's no longer for me. And it's like, you know that season's coming to an end and you actually rejoice at it because the Holy Spirit saying, you know, I'm detoxing you from the past. I'm detoxing you from, from um, not necessarily, well, yeah, toxic relationships, but also things that, that give you a wrong perception of me, right? So that's one of the things that the Lord will do. That's one of the lenses that the Holy Spirit gives you initially, uh, which is discernment. And sometimes you're not going to know it's discernment. It's just like a knowing that the Holy Spirit gives you. When you really receive the Holy Spirit, you're like, oh, man, like, I don't know, something feels off about just, just hanging out with these people. For example, and that could be the Holy Spirit tugging you, like, you know, walk in the light. Yeah. As I'm in the light, right? The darkness gets, gets, well, yeah, exposed, but also um, you're able to see, like, oh, yeah, that's not supposed to be there. Let me avoid that. Bro. Feel like, you know, the, the tug to separate yourself from places, uh, from people, right? Uh, do it. It means you outgrew your surroundings, right? It means God is trying to do more in your life. But the only way He can do more is if you separate yourself, right? It says, so you can, you can be a clean vessel, right? So you, because God has prepared each and every one of us for good works before time. You know, we each have a purpose and a calling on our lives. Amen. Yeah, so it's just, uh, just a matter of running it, running it through the Word, right? Um, I'm going to say something, and I, I mean it from a sincere place, and for your own benefit, for our own benefit, right? Um, whenever you see someone calling out falsehood, first of all, you can discern the motives. When they attack character and they make it personal, that that's, that's comes out of the flesh. But whenever they do it with a sincere motive and they, they, um, they do it so that you don't be deceived, so that we won't be deceived, right? Because they're watching out for you. Because you read the entire New Testament, like you'll find like seven or eight places to where it specifically warns about the danger of falling away and the danger of, of falling into deceptive teachings and avoiding false teachers, avoiding people that are false prophets and false teachers. Jude talks about it. Second Peter talks about it. First John talks about it. First and Second Timothy talks about it. Philippians talks about it. It's like if there's four people, right? Yeah. There's four people and, and they're telling you, no, bro, this is blue. Mm. All those four people are telling you, this is blue. But there's one, right, that's actually right. He's like, no, that's red. Eventually, right, you, it says that bad company ruins good morals. Yeah. So eventually, you'll probably be like, okay, maybe it is blue, right? And that's how a little bad teaching, right, corrupts the body, corrupts the church. Yeah. That's why you have to, you know, the, the Bible says that the spiritual man, which, you know, by knowing the heart of God, right, it says he judges all things. Yeah. Judges all things as using the word as the standard of measurement. You cannot use a man's opinion as a standard of measurement because when you do that and the Holy Spirit tell, tells in your heart, you've already used a faulty um, standard of measurement. The, the word of God yeah. says, right, like a man thinks he's right in yeah. his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart, the heart yeah. and people use that as an excuse to say oh God knows my heart you know God knows that I love him and I'm over here smoking the blood mm -hmm. <laughs> for example mm -hmm. that should scare you God looks at the heart exactly he sees how corrupt you actually are that should, that should scare you but like a reverence to God to be like you know what let me, let me put it away we should treat this we should treat sin as this disease that you don't want on you it's like if somebody sneezes on you like a chew, right? I'm like... <clears throat> like a cancer, bro. Yeah. It's going to spread. Treat sin like that. Treat, treat sin like that, bro. It's going to spread and just start, you know... Yeah. It's contagious, bro. Everything. Yeah. So treat it like that right away. Get off of me. Wash your hands. With what what did Jesus, Jesus say, right? If your right hand causes you to sin, you know, cut it off. Yeah. If, if your right hand causes you to pick up that blunt, if your right hand causes you to pick up that drink, right? Cut the source of yeah. it off. Or if your eye, right, causes you to sin, you know... Cut it off, spiritually speaking. Yeah. Right? Avoid yourself. God will never allow you to be tempted more than you're able to bear. Amen. But with every temptation, right, He will provide a way out. So every time, right, you find yourself in a sinful situation, you should be asking God, God, where's the exit? Right? 
where's the exit? And he will show you. But it takes humility, right? We're supposed to humble ourselves under the hand of God, right? Resist the devil. And he will flee from you, yeah. Amen. Just to piggyback off of what you were saying, right? Um, God will not tempt you beyond what you can handle. And, you know what, don't get discouraged if you're like, man, I feel tempted uh, to go back into the things of the world. You know, maintain yourself strong. You know, confide in a brother that, you know, um, someone that, you're, that you can trust. It can be your family member or your pastor. Someone that you know that is going to steward you correctly. Not hit you with a rod, right, if it's not necessary. Because even Paul said to the Corinthians, should I come to you with a rod or should I come to you with a kiss? You decide. So there is a form of godly correction. I yeah, mean, bro, it's, it's like, you know, if I am struggling with something, right, and I tell you, hey, bro, you know, I'm trying my hardest, right? Yeah. You're like, hey, you know, don't worry about it. I'll help you pick that cross up. Yeah. You know, we're supposed to carry one another's burdens. That's the whole thing, right? That's as simple as it is, bro. It's like we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah. That fulfills the law. Well, that, um, the law of God. Because the law can be used in many contexts. The ceremonial law, the moral law, and then the law of loving your neighbor. I don't know what, what part of, of the law that is. You know, give me grace on that. <laughs> right? I don't know everything. But what, you, what, but what I have read, you know, uh, I tried to align it with the Word of God. Right? Everything that we're talking Align it with the Word of God. Judge it by the Word of God. Don't take it just because me or my brother is, is saying it, but judge it for yourself. Judge is, is my, our Word coherent with the Word of God. 